Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 108 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Fia. How are you guys doing today? What about Gavin? Yeah, what about me? Well, you see, I always forget Fia on Swap Corner in the episode, <laughs> so this was my way of making up for it by just Thanks, ignoring Mike. Gavin. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I was hoping that would have went a little bit smoother and you guys would have just went with it. However, all right, fine. No. We'll call it no, out. Can't get away with anything. We'll be uh, not at all, as it turns out. But regardless, how are both of you guys doing? I'm doing good. How about you guys? I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm doing fantastic as well. It's good to have you guys back. Um, this is going to be a, uh, if I remember correctly, a bit of a special episode, Gavin. Right? It is. Uh, this is a partial guest episode. Uh, although I have not yet done the uh, the interview part of the episode, so stay unlike, tuned for that. Unlike most podcasts where they record the interview before the rest of the, uh, before the intro, we're recording the intro before the interview. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I like to live on the edge. 100%. Um, 100%. So, uh, I don't yet know what uh, our guest, Dr. Ted Deschler, uh, of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, will be talking about, but I know what I'm going to ask him. Uh, I don't know where he's going to take that, but I guess you will uh, hear that at the end of the segment here. So the first half of this episode is going to be uh, going over some of the history of the museum and uh, uh, and some of the interesting people and some of the stuff that they have going on. And then I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Deschler can fill in some of the gaps that I found while just trying to do just like a quick Google research. Um, and I'll point out sort of those gaps and make it a point to, uh, to ask uh, Dr. Deschler during the second half of this episode. So I'm really excited. I got to go to this museum uh, a couple weeks ago at the time uh, this episode goes out, but uh, it was a really cool experience for me and some of the students that we took with my university. So uh, hopefully it'll be uh, pretty neat for you all to learn about as well. Definitely. I'm super looking forward to that. Yeah. So before we get into any of the, all of that goodness, Fia, let's do some housekeeping. Of course. So you guys know to don't forget to rate the show on whatever platform you listen to us on and to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, give us feedback about the show and any future topics you would like to hear on the podcast. And if you would like to be a guest on the show, be sure to fill out our guest form. And this can all be found in the show notes. And with that, Gavin, what is next episode's topic? So I'm sticking with the the trend of uh, the last handful of episodes, uh, or I guess the most recent like episode talking about a group of life, uh, where I'm going to be sticking with the marine invertebrates, just for you, Fia. Hooray! Um, so we'll be talking about cephalopods, Ooh. which is a really big, really broad group uh, with a lot of really neat members, but it is the group of mollusks that includes your squids, your octopuses, your cuttlefish, and uh, all of their shelled uh, ancient relatives, which is uh, really cool to talk about. Very cool. Looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. And Mike, uh, in the lead up to this episode, before we started recording, uh, you you said that there was uh, no lacking of uh, today in history for March fifteenth. So what do you got? All right. So we're I we're gonna do something we haven't done yet in today in history. I'm just gonna go rapid fire through a whole oh. bunch of stuff. Um. Cool. And so, just real quick, just to begin with the reason why March 15th is famous uh, from the Ides of March, this was in 44 BC. This is the day that Julius oh. Caesar was assassinated. Nice. So, Whoa. we're starting off, starting off strong here. 1493, Christopher Columbus returns to Spain after his voyage into the New World. Uh, in 1783, there was this plot called the Newburgh Conspiracy to overthrow the brand new United States and like install George Washington as king. And George <laughs> Washington gives a speech to the army and he's just like, don't do that. That's a bad idea, please. <laughs> um, in 1820, Maine gets admitted as the 23rd state into the Union, which fans of American history will know that means that Missouri was not long uh, to follow. Yep. Uh, we have uh, pitcher Cy Young retires from baseball after winning 511 games, the most wins of all time to this day. Wow. In 1913, we have the first U.S. presidential press conference by Woodrow Wilson. 
1917, mm-hmm. Tsar Nicholas II, the last Russian Tsar, gives up the throne. Is like, all right, I'm done. I'm just regular old citizen Nick. Now he and his family would all be killed later, so don't you worry. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> yep. Uh, in ni- don't mind me, just citizen Nick over here. As hundred percent. In 1923, Vladimir Lenin suffered his third stroke. Whoa. <laughs> In 1928, <laughs> Benito Mussolini modified the Italian electoral system, basically saying, I'm going to be in charge forever. He had consolidated the power a couple of years before, but still. Sure. And then, uh, like the guy from history, uh, you know, a uh, slightly overrated mustache. But in 1939, uh, Hitler invades Czechoslovakia. Wow. Which, you know, that was... Uh, uh, yeah, you were right. That was, uh, that was a big deal. March is pretty action-packed. You're not kidding. There was a whole bunch of stuff going on there. Um, so, yeah, Wilt Chamberlain scores 4,000 points in a game in, uh, in 1962. You've got... Uh, you want to say that again? Wilt Chamberlain, 4,000 points in his career. I said in the game, didn't I? Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was getting it confused with uh, Wilt Chamberlain scoring 100 points in a game, but of course... Uh, yeah. You're not going to score 4,000 points in a game. Not even the great Wilt was able to no. do that. And so mm-hmm. just... Uh, 1991, the Rodney King riots are happening um, mm. in L.A. Just on and on. It's a nice little fractal of incredible things that wind up taking place. There's a bunch of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame elections that uh, that I won't bother getting into. But uh, I had a lot of fun with the last, like, 90 seconds of this podcast. Uh, <laughs> and I, cer- I certainly hope you guys did. Fia with Swamp Corner, uh, I remembered you this time. I hope that you've got something at least half as good. Yeah, uh, it's pretty cute. Nothing, <laughs> nothing as major as that. I don't know how I'll top that. But uh, for you today on Swamp Corner, I have the freckled blenny, Hypsoblennius ion ionfess. This is a similar species to one that I talked about a while back, the feather blenny. Um, they are a comb tooth blenny uh, found in the Western Atlantic region from South Carolina to Texas, um, along the coast of the United States. They are herbivorous because they, not because, but they're comb tooth blennies because they have teeth that are like bristles, like a, like a comb. And so they use those okay. um, teeth to kind of chisel away and scrape algae and detritus from the surface of things. So they mostly eat algae and detritus, but um, so a study of their diet also found that they can have some content of crustaceans like barnacles, amphipods, and decapods and polychaetes, which are basically just marine worms um, in their gut mm-hmm. content. Their eggs are demersal and adhesive, so they basically spit out their eggs onto a substrate and they stick there. Um, so They spit them... <clears throat> Uh, they don't spit them. They shoot them out of their <laughs> uh, <laughs> reproductive organs. Uh, Say the word. Their reproductive organs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Gavin, I know that you are thinking of the exact same episode of Scrubs as I am right now. Anyway. Am I? Oh. Are you unfamiliar with when, when Elliot cannot say a certain feminine? Oh, yeah. You're right. There we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. That's me. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> on a science podcast, well, they also technically have different. They have different parts, technically. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Such as, I don't well, know. <laughs> um, the technical term for uh, any variety of organ, because they're different, um, that delivers sperm from the male to the female, is called an intromittent organ. Uh, and most fish don't actually have that. Um, but in most fish, the females, I believe it's a cloaca, so it's all one hole. Some don't, some have separated holes for reproduction and for, uh, you know, waste elimination purposes. But I think in most fish, it's a cloaca. So there you go, Mike. I I went around your, your logic. I mean, cloaca still sounds like a great name. I might just start using that and see how far I get. I... Sure, buddy. You go for that. <laughs> Anywho. Anywho. Uh, Anywho the... would also work for that kind of name. <laughs> <laughs> so they lay their eggs on um, any sort of substrate that the eggs can adhere onto. And then once they hatch, 
their larvae are often found in shallow coastal waters and the freckled bunny is something that I commonly find on my oyster reefs. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for that, Fia. And with that, let's get into the main topic, which is the Academy of Natural Sciences, as you'll mostly hear it called. Uh, although formally, it is called the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University, which is a university in Philadelphia. Uh, for most of its history, it was actually known as the Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia, uh, the sort of affiliation with Drexel University, uh, I think happened in like 2011 or 2010. Wow. So like, and then I'll talk about more about this in a little bit, but um, I've read dozens of papers that were like published by the museum and I never knew, you know, I'd never known that it was affiliated with Drexel um, because that was so recent. And even like up until like, a year ago, I didn't even know it was affiliated with them. And that's something that uh, I'd like to talk to Dr. Deschler about the, why the museum decided to become affiliated with, uh, with Drexel because he was there during that time. So I'd like to sort of get his perspective on that, but this is a really, really historic museum. And in uh, insert episode number here, we talked about, the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York City, mm -hmm. which is old, for sure. Uh, however, this particular museum was founded in 1812. Wow. Yeah. So is that so new or old? That makes it the oldest natural science institution in the Americas. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. Incredible. Right. And so, uh, that being said, it didn't open its doors to the public for people to come see stuff until 1828, which I think is still a good bit before the American Museum or the Smithsonian, hmm. which I think would be off the top of my head, the two that would sort of give it a run for its money here in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, a quick question when it comes to the uh, the length. I'm I guess I'm assuming we're assuming one of two things here. Either... Um, number one, this is like the longest, like continuous still opening, um, one, or were there, I'm trying to think here, is this the kind of thing where, um, there would have been some kind of native American equivalent that has since been wiped out or was this just not a discipline that, um, even if we're trying to count and be as generous as possible to, to the first peoples that were on this continent, this just kind of wasn't the thing that would have existed until that time. I th yeah, I think it's more the, the second one, mm -hmm. where I just don't think um, that this was something that they were particularly interested in. Obviously, as we talked about in, a, you know, we had a whole episode more or less about native paleontology around the world and like how, uh, you know, indigenous peoples have used fossils in their culture for, you know, thousands and thousands of years. I just don't think that taking things from one spot and putting it in a collective space mm -hmm. Uh, for these purposes is just something that many native cultures w did. Understood. Um, particularly, you know, especially as we'll talk about, um, museums tend to be very extractive institutions. Mm -hmm. Um, they tend to take things that usually don't belong to them. Right. Um, and so, uh, in particular, I don't think native American people's would have had you know like a dedicated place of learning about these things that's mo probably something that they just did through their um stories and like oral traditions that sounds about right yeah um and so the the main reason that they wanted to build this thing in the first place um was because frankly they were getting clowned on by the europeans um, <laughs> That was kind of a thing in Europe because these big museums like the British Museum in, you know, in London um, had been sending out explorers and, and people to bring stuff back to them for quite a while by this point. Even if it wasn't, you know, as formal and structured as it is today. And uh, all the Europeans did not view people in the, the New World as particularly smart. 
So they wanted to build a center for studying the natural world that rivaled all of those institutions in Europe. That was sort of the main goal with starting this place. And it was founded by lots of uh, people who were like the founders of their field at the time. Uh, most of whom I had never even heard of, so I'm not going to bore you with the names. Um, <laughs> but just super influential people that you've probably heard if you've taken, um, you know, like biology 101, geology 101. You've probably heard their name in like the first or second lecture <laughs> and then never been quizzed on it. So you don't know it, mm. uh, at least in my case. And so, like I said, this was early 1800s. And Mike, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here as the, the history person. This is going to go rough. Here we go. What, in general, just give us the general vibe of early 1800s Philadelphia. Early 1800s Philadelphia. Um, it, it was, I believe, um, by the 1800s, we had moved the capital um, from... Uh, you know, from Philadelphia and various other places to Washington, D.C. Um, but it was still a place where a lot of official business got conducted, a lot of official government business got conducted. Um, I'm not too sure of a whole lot of the specifics that took place in Philadelphia, but, it, you know, it is not that far removed from being the nation's capital itself. Um, is there anything in right. particular you're trying to lead me towards here? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a large city in the 1800s and like, you know, for all, you know, we historians like to try and look back and make history come alive for people, you know, yada, 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 like, you know, going back in time kind of sucked, like sewage systems, <laughs> sewage systems were not, you know, entirely up to snuff uh, at particularly at this point. Um, yeah. There is, you know, there's not that much to do like the, um, the Americas had not begun to go through their industrial revolution yet. So you know, even, you know, big cities, you're still relying quite a bit on, um, on agriculture from just outside the city borders. So, um, I'm certainly not going to pretend like I know much about the specifics of, uh, um, of Philadelphia or any other city at that time. But I mean, it was a, it was a city in the 1800s pre-industrial revolution. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's pretty much all I was kind of looking for. Yep. Um, but sort of just compared to today where you think of like where are sort of the quote unquote cultural centers of the United States, most people will probably name like New York and LA probably mm -hmm. maybe some places like uh, San Francisco, maybe like some, somewhere in Texas, like Austin or Dallas or something. Um, right. I mean, it depends on what you're talking about, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the early 1800s, uh, Los Angeles, like, didn't exist, really. Um, it's part of Spain. That and, point. well, yes, that's that's right. And so was Texas, for that matter. Um, and so Philadelphia was kind of like the cultural center of, you know, life in the early United States. And so when they were thinking of a place to build this this museum, naturally, Philadelphia was the choice. Um, they had lots of different other scholarly societies, like the, uh, I think it's like Philosophical Society of America was centered in Philadelphia at the time. So this was just sort of the natural place to do it. Um, and here are some just general famous people who have been affiliated with the museum in various ways, uh, in my personal opinion. Uh, the most famous two are Joseph Leidy and Edward Drinker Cope. Hmm. Oh, that one sounds we've, familiar. Um, yeah, we've mentioned Edward Drinker Cope a number of times on the podcast. Is that Bone Wars uh, guy? Famously, one of the Bone Warriors. Bone Wars! <laughs> yes. Uh, Edward Drinker Cope throughout the uh, late 1870s, throughout the early 1890s, um, Edward Drinker Cope was in a vicious rivalry with Othniel Charles Marsh of Yale University. Uh, basically just to see who could collect and name the most fossils, mostly from places that uh, they should not have been taking them from. Um, and so they basically just had this giant contest to see who could name the most species, collect the most fossils, mostly of dinosaurs, but also of some other stuff. And uh, Edward Drinker Cope was affiliated with this museum. So uh, that was some really cool things that we got to see behind the scenes. We got to see some fossils that were found and named by him. So that was pretty cool. 
Um, the other name that I mentioned there, Joseph Lighty, was a much uh, cooler head of paleontology at the time. He was the one who trained Cope. And once the whole Bone Wars thing started, he was like, I'm going to sort of retire, but mostly start working on mammals. <laughs> I'll be over here <laughs> while you kids go do your thing. So those two in particular, you know, did huge things for studying natural science, um, naming a bunch of species and also just updating our understanding of uh, a lot of things. Because as famous as especially Cope is for paleontology, he also was a incredibly famous ichthyologist. So studying fish, um, the uh, toward the end of his life, he donated his personal collection of fish specimens to the museum and it like tripled the collections of the museum. Wow. Yeah. So some other famous names, uh, John James Audubon of the Audubon Society. Whoa. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're not familiar, that is sort of like the International Ornithology Association, which is the study of birds. If you ever heard of like the Audubon Handbook or Audubon Field Guide, that's named after him. So those were folks that were actually working at the museum doing their research. However, as cultural institutions often do, uh, they have sort of affiliates that are not working at the, the place day to day, but will contribute some things every now and then. And so this list is much more lucrative, including Thomas Jefferson. Mm. Thomas Jefferson was actually quite famous for being uh, a, a, a very avid enjoyer of nature and wanting mm. to study and understand nature. He had a lot of different interests. He's a fascinating guy to study. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk more about uh, how pretty much all of these folks are problematic. Um, <laughs> but Right, but in um, interesting ways. Yes. Uh, Tom Jefferson will actually come up again in a little bit. But yeah, so he would contribute things to the museum every now and then. Uh, Richard Owen from over across the pond, once this place sort of got a reputation for itself, um, some international scientists decided that they wanted to contribute things every now and then or work with the folks that were there, including Richard Owen, who was um, one of the early people in comparative anatomy, sort of alongside uh, the star of episode 103, George Cuvier, who also was affiliated with the museum. Um, listen to episode 103, all about this guy. <laughs> So that was sort of more in the earlier days of the museum. But then as the, the time went on, some folks like Charles Darwin would contribute things to the museum every now and then, as well as his close associate, Thomas Henry Huxley. Nice. And uh, also, I would mostly got these names from the Wikipedia page. And virtually everyone else um, that I looked into, I was like, oh, their field of, field of study is kind of neat. Uh all of their Wikipedia pages were like, this person was an absolutely degenerate racist. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, and we've talked all about George Cuvier's uh, things. Richard Owen was a very notorious racist and just a jerk in general. Um, Most racists are. So, yeah. And as pr this isn't unique to this museum, <laughs> uh, pretty much any scholarly place that wanted to try to study nature in um i'd say honestly up until like the 80s and possibly up until now uh have some people in them who are quite overtly racist and try to use science to justify that Aww. we talked about that a whole bunch in episode 103 about george cuvier if you want a more in-depth discussion go check out that episode um but yeah lots of people who studied like race science that was like their field listed on Wikipedia. And I'm like, I don't need to say your name on this podcast. No, we do not promote but, them. Right. And so just all of that to say, this place was sort of bumping in terms of the early foundational days of what we now recognize as modern science. And this museum, among many things that they're famous for, like these people, are famous for a lot of different fields of study. Because unlike places like 
the American Museum of Natural History, which was sort of at its core a, a very paleontology-heavy museum. Um, they have lots of other collections as well, yeah. Um, but that is sort of the thing that they're known for. Uh, and that is sort of the case with the Academy of Natural Sciences as well. Um, at various points, just being known as the Dinosaur Museum. Hmm. But here is a, a quick list of highlights of some neat things that I learned through some of this research as well as visiting. All right. Many of the earliest fossils found in North America are housed here, still currently, uh, including the first dinosaur ever found in North America, and then, you know, also likely in the, the Americas, because I don't think there's too much, uh, you know, academic science going on down in South America at this point, but I don't know that for sure. Um, but it was a duck-billed dinosaur found in New Jersey, actually, not a place most people think of for dinosaurs. Hmm. Uh, one of the first ever theropod dinosaurs known at all, not just in North America, but in the whole world. One of the first handful uh, oh. found also in New Jersey called Dreptosaurus. Coolest thing ever found in New Jersey. Uh, yeah, it's actually their state fossil. Whoa. Uh, for more on theropod dinosaurs, episode 104. Nice. This particular museum houses lots of things found by Lewis and Clark. Hey. Yeah, if you've if you've Why? ever heard in you know elementary school history about Lewis and Clark and their you know journey across the continent to find the Pacific Ocean, more or less, um, they also just did things every now and then. Like particularly in Jefferson's administration, he would just kind of send them places, hmm. uh, and they would go and collect stuff and bring it back. Especially because Jefferson was so interested in the natural world, he just wanted to know stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a. Uh, Mastodon, which is, we've talked uh, about those a, a good amount. It's a sort of elephant cousin uh, that's pretty distantly related, but if you saw it, you'd definitely just say that's an elephant. Um, but a a lot of the skeleton that they found in, like, a cave in Kentucky, like, I think somebody, somehow Thomas Jefferson got word of this, and he was like, hey, I think this one was mostly Lewis, but he's like, Lewis, go get me those bones. And he did. And now they're at the at this museum. <laughs> Yeah, Jefferson actually had, like, a number of, like, personal fossils that he kept in the White House during really? his presidency, and now a decent amount of them are here at the Academy. Um, as for some of the things that the museum has that's a little bit more recent, uh, they actually have a, an enormous collection of diatoms. What? Which are? And you might be wondering, small hey, things. what are those? <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes, very small things. They are these single-celled, uh, photosynthetic things that make like a little shell out of uh, silica or quartz, essentially, or glass. Um, and they live in the water. They live all over, but these particular uh, collections are from freshwater sources all around the United States. And they take them from the same location at like different times. So they've kept like a running history to see like what species are found, what, you know, how many of each species are found if it's like 10% of this species in like, you know, 1840, how does that change over time? Mm -hmm. um, and this is the largest collection of diatoms like this in the entire world. Wow. Yeah. And that's kind of a, a, a thing because those are, because they're photosynthetic, they are really good uh, sort of analog for, in just in general environmental conditions. Mm-hmm. And so uh, they started doing that really early. Um, and that's kind of a theme is that they started studying just like the quality of how nature was doing earlier than most people kind of cared <laughs> mm -hmm. about how well nature was doing. They also uh, started the Journal of the Academy of Natural Sciences, which was Whoa. the first natural science journal in the Americas, which started in 1817, but uh, ceased publication in 18... or. Uh, uh, 1918. So what, so, it had a 100-year run? Pretty much, yeah. It's pretty good. Um, if you do pretty much any vertebrate paleontology like research, uh, you've definitely read things from this, which is why uh, the only reason I knew about this place is because uh, a lot of the sources that I cited in my master's thesis reference things from this journal. Hmm. Why did they stop? I'm not sure. They do a handful of other 
like periodic, I think maybe a little more specialized uh, publications every now and then. Um, but I think at the time this was just like as, as regular of a journal as any other scientific journal. Um, I think it was just, you know, maybe they weren't getting as many submissions as they wanted. Maybe just other competition was cropping up and they decided it wasn't worth it anymore. I don't know. Okay. Uh, one thing that I also thought was cool was that they have this sort of database that they call Virio or Virio, which is an acronym for the Visual Resources for Ornithology. And it is the most comprehensive collection of bird images anywhere in the world. Just pictures. Pictures of birds. <laughs> I love that. They started that uh, much more recently in 1979. And the collection is over 180,000 photographs. And I'm sure that that's actually a little out of date. Wow. Yep. So almost 200,000 photographs representing uh, like three quarters of all bird species, over 7,000 different species of birds. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's not like they're just, you know some guy out with their 2012, you know, first gen iPhone taking pictures. These are like professional photographs pretty much all of them. So that's just a super impressive collection. Bird people, man. They really, I know. I tried to get into birding a little bit like during COVID and I was like, I can't keep up. There's too many of them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Like a lot of other museums, if you go to visit it, uh, they have lots of taxidermied animal dioramas. Um, that were all the rage back in sort of the early 1900s, uh, back when, um, you know, the white man was beginning to explore more of the the non-white world. Um, and they would bring back things that they stole uh, and put them on display for people to see. Hmm. And they would taxidermy them in sort of a lifelike position. That sort of thing was started at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Um And so a lot of other museums all across the world sort of picked up on that trend. Uh, But unlike the American Museum, uh, the Academy of Natural History uh, of Natural Sciences has not really updated them too much since. So it's a cool sort of time capsule of like the the scientific thought back in the the 20s and the 30s when these were all being built. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And then... As any museum should, they also do a lot of public education work, which I think is super important to point out. Um, Like I said, this was sort of the first place not only to start collecting these things, but to put them on display. Because anybody can be a hoarder. Uh, It's when you take Mm -hmm. the things that you're hoarding and make education out of them that you become a museum. (laughs) So in 1868, the Academy uh, was the first ever in the world to put on display a mounted dinosaur. So like a dinosaur, you know, put on a metal frame to show you, at least at the time, how they thought the bones all fit together. So you could see it, you know, at full scale, life size, in person. Um, And they did that uh, pretty much at the direction of that Joseph Leidy guy, which is why I I like him. He he thought it was just so important that people see these really cool animals uh, and, and, you know, in person and get to appreciate them that way. Hmm. And here's sort of where that gap that I mentioned comes in, where just there isn't just a whole lot from like the early 1900s up until... The next thing that I was able to find was in uh, 1986. Wow, Mm. that's a big gap. So uh, this is when they sort of opened an incredibly famous for the time uh, exhibit called Discovering Dinosaurs. And it really was kind of a showcase of like all the dinosaur knowledge that we had up to that point. Um, And even today, there are still lots of really cool dinosaurs and stuff on display, but... uh, especially at that time, this was sort of like the dinosaur museum in the world. And that's kind of it. Like I said, uh, they also do a lot of work on genetics and things, which is obviously much more recent. Um, However, that's a world that I am not nearly as well versed in Mm -hmm. as uh, paleontology and natural history on like the physical side. (laughs) So um, I know that they have like really, that's, 
according to Dr. Deschler on the sort of little tour that we got, that is sort of forward looking where the museum is putting a lot of their efforts going forward mm -hmm. is a lot of genetic archiving, which is interesting because obviously if you think, well, we can put their bones in these, uh, you know, drawers and stuff and hoard those, why can't we code the DNA and put that in a database somewhere? Um, which a lot of museums are doing, but this museum in particular, that's sort of one of their main focuses for the future, which I think is really neat. Very neat. Mm -hmm. And then just to sort of end with a little bit of a segue to our interview, in 2011, the Academy became an affiliate with Drexel University, um, which I only knew from sports because they have a dragon as their mascot, and I thought that was neat. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I'll, I'll have Dr. Deschler talk a little bit more about that, but uh, just a quick sort of preview into Dr. Deschler himself. Uh, he mostly works on uh, sort of the transition of fish up onto land into what we would recognize as amphibians. And so in order to do that, their fishy fins had to turn into a salamander-like leg. And that is one of the you know, sort of real missing stories for a long time in evolution. And he was part of the team that discovered one of the most important fossils uh, in that sort of transitional sequence. Uh, he was on the, the team that discovered Tiktaalik back in 2006, uh, way up in the, the northern parts of Canada, and he's been to Antarctica a number of times. Uh, but cool. a lot of his sort of intro to that topic started right here in sort of central Pennsylvania, where I currently live, uh, pretty much right between where I live and Williamsport, which is where they do the Little League World Series. Very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and fun fact, uh, as we learned just as we were chatting over lunch, he actually did his master's thesis on basically the exact same thing that I did, uh, no but at a location in California. So we talked about that like same time period and everything uh, it was kind of weird that is weird so uh hopefully you enjoyed learning a little bit about this neat museum if you're ever in philadelphia uh, i'm sure there are a thousand museums in philadelphia about all sorts of history things absolutely there are. um but yeah make this uh make this a a, a journey make this part of your trip to philadelphia if you ever do so um with that, thank you guys both for indulging me about this little museum, and we'll uh, turn things over to myself and Dr. Deschler. All right, so we are back with our wonderful guest, Dr. Ted Deschler of the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. Welcome, and uh, thank you for, for helping us out. Thank you. Oh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. So as the listeners have already heard, the museum is really unique in North America for being as old as it is and having just sort of the breadth of collections that it does. But something that I mentioned in the, in the previous section was how the museum doesn't necessarily have much, uh, at least that I could find, of a paleontological history between the late 1800s or so and then up to relatively recently. And just sort of in our chatting before we started recording, you said that you might be able to uh, help us fill in that gap. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and then how you came to the museum. Okay, glad to. Yeah, you know, there's this very illustrious, very important early history, especially in paleontology at the Academy of Natural Sciences and names like Lydie and Cope that people are familiar with. Um, and both of them um, died in the 1890s. And especially Cope had sort of moved on from his um, connections with the Academy of Natural Sciences, although he was very much an important Philadelphian. Um, right. But after Cope died um, and sort of his estate was settled and the Academy uh, did not bid on some of the collections that were in his estate, um, they went mm -hmm. to the American Museum in New York instead, um, the Academy kind of got out of the business of vertebrate paleontology. Um, and so all okay. through the 20th century, there just was nobody. Um, I was very lucky to be hired there in the uh, late 1980s. And after being there as a collections manager, I was, went back to school, got a PhD, and actually was 
um, the first curator since Edward Drinker Cope when I got the curator position in 1998. So there was about 100 years there without yeah. active research at the Academy. So was it just not a priority for them or was it sort of a funding thing? You know, it's, 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 I, it's a little hard to say. I think there was a little bit of bad taste in people's mouths because Cope was a bit difficult. And at the, so I think the early 1900s or the turn of the century there, um, people were like, you know, let's do other things. And of course, natural history. There's so many fields of, right. of natural history and you can't do all of them. And the Academy especially, you know, you just cannot have uh, someone doing spiders and someone doing insects and someone doing fish and birds and herps and mollusks and all of it. So uh, generally, there have been about 10 to 12 curators, uh, and it does sometimes move around between one field and another. Uh, I'm glad to say Bert Paleo is back and going strong at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Yeah, I am as well, especially given how uh, historically important it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned in the earlier half, and then just with uh, us talking, you know, a couple of weeks ago when I was at the at the Academy, um, that a lot of the species that I worked with for my master's thesis were named by folks like uh, Cope and Lighty. So if you would yeah. have asked me, uh, I never would have known that, uh, you know, the Academy stopped doing uh, any yeah. paleo yeah. stuff. That was the heyday, my goodness, because there weren't a lot of other places in the country for, uh, for scientists to work, for collections to, to be assembled, you know. The Smithsonian comes in the 1850s, and, mm -hmm. and a lot of the other big museums come in the 1880s and 90s, kind of the industrial age, and you know, big philanthropists and all that. But the Academy, being founded in 1812, was right there as so many of these foundational pieces and new material being collected as the West was opening up and all that kind of stuff. The Academy was right there and uh, served a really important um, uh, as a venue for kind of people to learn and talk and keep collections. And so I'm hoping we're bringing some of that back, but there's no doubt, of course, that there's there's great paleo going on across the country and around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to your earlier point on uh, Cope leaving a bad taste in their mouth, uh, we've had a whole episode about the Bone Wars. Uh -huh. So uh, <laughs> we uh, hopefully listeners have heard that one and they can uh, understand why that might be the case. Yep. Sounds sounds right. So I guess let's uh, talk a little bit about um, the some of the more recent history then. So in all reading all these things by Cope and Lighty, I did not know until quite recently that the Academy was part of Drexel University and you were sort of there when that happened. That's a really new affiliation. So what was sort of the driver of that sort of thing happening? Great. Good, good question, because it is uh, it's a little bit of a new paradigm for an institution like the Academy of Natural Sciences. So Right about on the 200th anniversary of the Academy, <laughs> uh, founded 1812, so right in around 2011, 2012, um, a very insightful new president of the Academy of Natural Sciences. And we had, honestly, we had gone through a string of presidents every three or four years of the museum, mm -hmm. and it wasn't healthy. And the Academy never really was very strong during that time. Anyway, this, this new president, his name is George Gephardt, um, he said, we need a partnership. We just need a partnership. And I was actually part of sort of his management group and uh, being within the, the, our, our, my area of science and, and representing our scientific enterprise at the Academy. We talked about what would be uh, the kind of partner that would be good. And we talked about it, you know, commercial partners like Comcast is right a couple blocks away from us in okay. Philly. We thought, well, could Comcast be our partner? And we thought, well, who knows? And then when it was, when the idea of an academic partner came up, that was just the sensible thing. And right. of course, we have a lot of a lot of schools here in town. And um, there's Penn, and there's Temple, and there's Drexel, and outside of town, there's Villanova and Bryn Mawr and mm -hmm. all this stuff. And um, I'm not sure exactly how the Drexel thing came to the t came to the top, but it was very clear that uh, George Gephardt and the president at Drexel, um, John Fry, were seeing eye to eye on this. And when they had their discussions, it was like, "Wow, this is a win-win." If the academy could affiliate, um, if if essentially we became a 
a subsidiary of Drexel. Um, okay. Our scientific staff could be professors there. The Drexel would help pay our salaries. The museum itself, the public spaces and the collections um, would help with the maintenance of those areas and the programming would be supported by Drexel and not just the scientists at Drexel um, and the students at Drexel, but even the, the, the sort of Drexel has a very creative school called the Westfall School and they did films for us. And uh, the, school oh, of nice. the School of Education connected on early childhood development and on and on um, computer sciences. Um, we've been, we still are very much finding sort of synergies with Drexel. And um, uh, honestly, for me, um, it's been the connection to students that has really brought extra energy to the science and the scientists at the academy. And for the students, it's a very unique opportunity to connect into an institution like the academy, the depth of the collections, the expertise of the scientists and the collections managers. So it's really been a win-win and um, glad to say that uh, it's, 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 it's really helped both institutions. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, a lot of other, you know, institutions, whether they be purely academic or purely uh, sort of museum, they sort of try to do their own thing. You know, for example, like the Yale Peabody Museum, that's, mm -hmm. that's always been affiliated with Yale or um, the American Museum they have their own graduate programs in paleontology. And I think they even have a master's in uh, like earth science education. So they have their own school that is not really part of any other traditional academic institution. So that's sort of coming together is a, is a really unique thing. Yeah, you're, you're uh, right. You're right, Gavin. It's kind of a new model. And, and um, there has always been the kind of university museum model. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is something a little different. And um it's not without some, you know, uh, we're learning new things and there's some unforeseen consequences and, and there's some, you know, just growth pains uh, along the way. But uh, I think a lot of people are kind of keeping an eye on it as a good potential for those freestanding museums that are around the country. Not, not many of them quite as old and big as the Academy, but right. these freestanding museums it's that difficult time for them. I've been at the Academy long enough that I remember when there was city funding, it's just a line item in the city budget to support nonprofits like the Academy because the school of mm -hmm. education, the, 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 the Philly schools would use it. And there's a state line item. So from Harrisburg in Pennsylvania, we would get a certain amount per year just to keep these important institutions going. And guess what? That has all gone away in the last. Yeah. 10, 15, 20 years. And that's really put the institutions like the Academy that, that do have a, a public trust. Uh, uh, this guy, George Gephardt, used to say, we are a, um, an institution with public trust, but without public funding. <laughs> so that was his way yeah. of saying, damn, we, we, we don't have the... Um, so we have to raise all our own money, or write grants, philanthropic money, mm -hmm. foundation money. Um, uh, money from people coming in the front gate. And really, it's the tight squeeze. And many institutions feel that squeeze. And so this model is being examined and, and, and may very well be something that people in the future look to as a good idea in some cases. Yeah, I agree. Um, I know in particular, with my grad school in South Dakota, while our museum was sort of affiliated with our, uh, you know, university, there were lots of just like, little small town, uh, like dinosaur museums, like all over Wyoming and Montana. Mm -hmm. And and I know some folks who who work at those museums and it's always a struggle to try and find funding mm -hmm. uh, as, as it is, you know, in every sort of field of science. No doubt. No doubt. So, so I'm not sure what the future holds for all the smaller museums, but, um, you know, connecting, finding win-win type affiliations. Uh, it's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, we, we've had a previous episode, I think it was our one year anniversary episode where we, you know, interviewed a whole bunch of paleontologists in, in different fields, both museum and academic and uh, who do like field monitoring and that kind of thing. So you've sort of had a bit of both of the purely museum and now more mm -hmm. uh, teaching. So how has your sort of 
workflow changed throughout the the affiliation yeah very interesting um it's that teaching piece of it that's um you can't not give teaching the time that it takes you know you can't do it on the side It, it has to be your number one priority in the times that you know you're you're responsible for some teaching um and it has left potentially you know some of those hours have taken away from hours that I would have spent uh, working in the collections, maybe being in the field, collecting, um, uh, helping write proposals to benefit, to rebuild, to rehouse collections and that sort of thing. But I also think that um, the influx of not only the sort of expertise from throughout Drexel, but also Mm -hmm. the students and the energy that the students bring, both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, I think that sort of, even if we've diminished the amount of time that that those of us who are joint appointed, meaning we are curators, but we're also professors, um, if we have, if some of our time being curators has been pulled away, I think that the benefits that we are getting from being affiliated are at least as much as the benefits as if we were sitting in our collections, uh, organizing, databasing, writing grants, whatever the case might be. Um, so it's so it's just been a and so it's been an adjustment for people like myself. And mm-hmm. it's but it's it's only natural. And honestly, honestly, I think it's the way of the future. I don't think there's a lot of you know, hey, I'm the world expert in X, and so I'm just gonna go to my office, close the door. And work eight right. hours every day. I, oh, academics don't even have a clock. <laughs> academics basically <laughs> work twenty four seven on whatever interests them. But you know they're not going to just close their door and and do what they do because they're the world expert. They're going to have to share that knowledge. They're going to have to um, make sure you know that the next generation and, and and that there's public outreach and all that kind of stuff happens. And that's just the way the world is right now. Right. And it's something that can kind of get lost um, is is that, you know, sharing the information is the whole point of doing science. Good point. Yeah. It has to pass along. Everybody's everybody sees this, that um, if you're the if you are an expert in something and then you you retire and and your notes go to the archives, you know, sure, somebody else might pick it up, but it's much better if you have sort of a uh, the sort of mentorship um, job as well along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And here, just to sort of add to our collection of paleontologists that we've uh, had on on the show, uh, I guess, tell us how you sort of became a paleontologist and now, you know, all the way through from when you got interested in, you know, fossils or or earth sciences in general, and then all the way through till uh, now. Super. Yeah, um, I, I, I may be a little bit not traditional, at least the sequence of events for me, not completely traditional, but then whose career ever is completely traditional, right? right? What is traditional? So I, um, as a kid, just was a, a, a family with naturalists and so always was into nature, knew when I went to college that I wanted to do something in natural history. We didn't really say STEM or something like that. Right. You know? We just said natural history. And I went to Franklin and Marshall College and um, pretty quickly found the geology major there. So you at Bucknell have mm-hmm. a very similar sorts of department, you know, um, right. wonderful um, small liberal arts schools that can really provide wonderful uh, geosciences, you know, if it becomes a priority. And, and it had always been a good priority at FM as it is at Bucknell. Um, yeah. So, um I particular so I loved geology. You know how you when you find something that comes relatively easily to you and you love it and you're passionate about it, it's like this is it, right? So so I yeah. did so as a geology major, um, I think I connected the most to soft rock geology and paleontology. And and it, well, I can really look at one professor, uh, doc, Dr. Roger Thomas, out there um, at F and M as the one with the biggest impact. Uh, amazingly, like insightful, um, really creative scientist. Um, 
really someone who challenged us and all the rest. So I even did a senior thesis uh, with Roger Thomas out there on some Cambrian uh, little invertebrate things. Anywho, um, I realized I, I sort of took a year off after college, after being a geology major there, uh, and thought, well, maybe grad school's in the cards, and took a, what we used to take GREs and took it in yep. ge geology, did really good in the paleo section of that. So I thought, I'll just do paleontology and see if I like it as specifically. And sure enough, I, okay. I did a master's out in Cal Berkeley. Um, that was about five years of my life between lip moving out there, doing the work, having a job out there briefly. And then I got the job in Philly as a collections manager, came back a few years as collections manager, then realized I could go to Penn and get a PhD. So I did. Yeah. And I've just enjoyed every bit of it for, for you know, it goes back to my childhood and my college years and just a fascination in geology. And, and I like turning people on to geology. I, it's just such a, um, it's just it, it, everybody, I wish everybody like connected to understanding change on earth, rates of change, um, you know, looking at rock and reading the stories that rocks can tell us and understanding the history of life. I think those should be like, Part of every curriculum, and because uh, uh, it's it's fun and it's important to get that perspective. Absolutely. So uh, this past week, I was actually at the uh, Northeast Southeast Joint sort of section meeting of the Geological Society of America. Saw that, yeah. And a whole bunch of uh, the sessions that I went to. So for anybody who's not an academic and who doesn't uh, go to these types of conferences, there are more or less four hour, sometimes they're a little shorter, but uh, sessions of uh, like 20 minute or so talks and all of them in the same session are around the same sort of concept. Uh, so several of the whole sessions that I went to were all about how to get people who are not already geology students interested and, uh, you know, passingly knowledgeable for what they need in their everyday life in geology, because it is so important. But only, I think, two states require any earth science at all in high school. That's, I agree. I've heard that, and that's crazy. Well, so I'm glad that GSA, at least, is talking about that. Wow. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, the, the three of us hosts uh, went to high school in New York, which is one of the two that requires <laughs> it. Most other states have some kind of environmental science that they get a bit but it was only mostly focused on like weather and climate, which is obviously really helpful in this day and age. But uh, in terms of just how geology affects everything around us all the time, uh, that's just not, you know, something that is expressed to people as often as uh, we think it should. Uh, we might be a little biased. <laughs> we might. But. Yeah. I'm really glad to hear you say that, Gavin. I, it's so true. It really is. I think it's, to me, it's like perspective, right? I mean, here we are, human yeah. beings on the earth in 2023. Gosh, I, I just did a, a little thing in my last historical geology class, so the last class of the term. And mm -hmm. um, there was this table that I found that said that there was basically sort of technologies and humans, meaning technologies in a very broad sense. And it talked about digital technologies, and it said, two generations of digital technology. Then it talked about sort of industrial technologies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, internal combustion engines and stuff. And it said 10 generations of humans. Then they talked about agricultural technology. And it said you go back about 200 generations of humans. But then it talked okay. about hunter-gatherers and, you know, where we came from. And we're talking thousands and thousands of generations. Right. So, we we are this like species that on this planet and we don't begin to sort of realize how intimately connected everything is and how important all these processes all these earth systems are and if we don't understand it we're just naive and we do dumb stuff and i so i wish every politician <laughs> had this perspective yeah. of depth of time and fragility and change through time some people think nothing changes and i say no it's that's the rule is not that nothing changes the rule is that things are changing all the time especially 
geologically, just at a rate that you and I don't get to watch very often. Yeah, I think that's a big thing that I always try to talk about whenever it's, you know, even a little relevant on this podcast is uh, often the the magnitude of a change, you know, in term, late, you know, recently it's been a lot of things with climate change where it's, you know, everyone here is like one and a half or two degrees Celsius is what we want to uh, prevent mm-hmm. or, or limit the warming to. But uh, the magnitude isn't necessarily the problem. It's the rate. Exactly. And that's something that I think a lot of people who don't work with long timescales kind of miss. Exactly. Yep. All right. So I guess to sort of uh, round out our discussion here, where I first heard your name was with the uh, sort of expedition that ended up finding uh, Tiktaalik. Good. Which for for the listeners who might not know is a uh, really important uh, fossil that is sort of transitional between fish fully in the water and then more amphibian-like things coming up onto land. Um, so I guess tell us some a bit uh, about some of your recent work in that sort of area. Glad to, glad to. Yeah, I've been very lucky to fall into a research program that um, that allows a lot of discovery and a lot of new uh, new exciting topics. Yeah, so started at the Academy of Natural Sciences, as I said, found I'd go back to Penn uh, for a PhD and um, a new young faculty member at Penn at the time was Neil Shubin. And so I connected with Neil and said, you know, hey, I, I'd like to do a PhD. And he and I bounced around ideas on what to do. And and he said, well, my previous advisor, meaning Neil's previous advisor, a guy mm-hmm. named Ferris Jenkins up at Harvard, um, always thought that someone should have another look at this Devonian rock in Pennsylvania. It's the Catskill Formation. It's these red sandstones, old stream deposits, and a handful of good fossils had come out of them, vertebrate fossils in the past, because it's non-marine. We're looking in these stream deposits. Anyway, so um, I had just had a, a child at the time, and I thought, I don't want to do field work in you know Mongolia or even out west. Why don't I work right here in Pennsylvania? And pretty quickly, partly fortuitously, because PennDOT had done some work, so they built some road cuts uh, through the Catskill Formation, kind of in the the, 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 the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Um, Pretty quickly, I was finding some really good stuff and kind of started to build these collections at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Devonian fossils. Uh, did some research, publications on a number of them. And one of the really uh, bigger stories was um, early, as you mentioned, early tetrapods, limbed animals, amphibian-like things, uh, which were coming out in the from the latest Devonian deposits of the Catskill Formation. So we're talking about 365 million years ago. And things like them had been found in Greenland, Ichthyostega, Acanthostega, mm-hmm. and in Europe, things like Ventastega, all these late Devonian tetrapods. And although we didn't, when we still haven't found really complete specimens, we've found good things that represent those critters limb bones, right. jaw bones, parts of the shoulders, all this. So that really got me into this question about the fin to limb transition and what ecosystem the fin to limb transition. Uh, was was happening within, you know, so what were the evolutionary um, pressures and therefore what were the adaptations that were leading from more a fin-like appendage to a more limb-like appendage? Because it, it did take 15 or 20 million years of, right. of fitting into different environments and so forth. So, and what environments it was happening in and it seemed to be stream systems. So then Neil Shoup, so I did my dissertation, uh, a few chapters on different critters from out there in Pennsylvania. And Neil Shubin and I, sitting around, thought we really need to find some slightly older Devonian rock, early part of the late Devonian. If we're really going to find things that are really between that more finny and more limmy type, excuse the uh, the fancy language here, finny and <laughs> limmy um, uh, uh, kind of adaptations. And so we learned about rocks way up in the Canadian Arctic, up on Ellesmere Island and some other islands up there. Uh, a little bit of research and uh, talking to some of the geologists who had done work up there. 
uh, led us to believe we would have good good chance of finding interesting critters potentially up there um, in rock that's about 375 million years old, so a little older than Pennsylvania. So right. long story, lots of logistics, fundraising um, to do our first expedition up there in 2019. Oh, excuse me. What am I saying? In 19, <laughs> 1999 was our first expedition. It's hard to believe. but And by now we've gone up there eight times and we're going to go back this summer too. And in those various trips up there, um, it was 2004 in on Southern Ellesmere Island in what's called the Fram Formation, where we really zeroed in on a site that we had found in previous years. We really were able to excavate that site. And sure enough, Several specimens of what we now call Tiktaalik rose, uh, numerous other animals from the same site, you know, uh, jacketed, relatively good material, still preserved in three dimensions and, and, and quite complete for the Devonian anyway. Um, jacketed materials in plaster, a lot of logistic challenges, just working there, getting there is a logistic challenge. Yeah, I'm sure. Much less wrapping chunks of rock and plaster. So and helicoptering them out and sending them back to Philly and doing the preparation. But we're there. We, we, in, in 2006, we published our first paper on the animal that we named Tiktaalik rose. And we're remar amazed at how remarkably it um, had features that you do see in uh, more primitive groups of lobe-finned fishes, the sarcoterygians. Um, yep. yet they're more derived, um, than things like lungfish and coelacanths. So we call them tetrapodomorphs. They're really more closely related to limbed animals. Um, although mm -hmm. clearly aquatic, but tiktaalik jumped out as a form that had a number of primitive things, but also derived features, things that we see in the earliest tetrapods, uh, in the development of more fin-like appendages and skulls with the ability to flatten and maybe pump air, you know, use lungs, primitive lungs, um, a whole bunch of things. And that's, it, it, it certainly is one of the most exciting things or probably the most exciting thing that I've had the pleasure of working on. Um, and, and it makes, you know, it has made our whole research program uh, benefit from that one animal has allowed for the discrete discovery and collecting and the description of of many, many more. So both in Pennsylvania, yeah. both in Pennsylvania and up in Nunavut on Ellesmere Island. We've even, Shubin and I, kind of had that same conversation. Where else should we go um, much more recently <laughs> and wrote a grant, wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation to look at late Devonian, excuse me, middle-ish, late middle Devonian. So now we're looking about 385 million years ago instead of Okay. 375 or 365 down in Antarctica, what's called the Aztec Siltstone, which is exposed in parts of the Transantarctic Mountains. So we spent two field seasons, talk about logistics, yikes, oh, um, I'm sure. in Antarctica, um, about a month at a time, although the field seasons took much more because there's a ton of training once you get down there before they right. put you out in the field. But so we've done it down there and we've collected... Um, a variety of things, nothing that's really informative as far as we know on the fin to limb transition, uh, but much of it's stuff that we still are going to continue work on. So I've been very lucky to be able to work Pennsylvania, to be able to work uh, Nunavut, Ellesmere Island, and to be able to work Antarctica. And the thing that all of those field programs have in common is a focus on non-marine beds from the, the, the late middle through the late Devonian, uh, because that's the time frame and the ecological setting where this origin of, of the earliest tetrapods, limbed animals, uh, was happening. Yeah. And that's, uh, so you mentioned this when we had some of our students uh, come for, for a tour of the mm -hmm. academy, but uh, Dr. Shubin wrote a book about this whole thing and about, you know, human evolution in general um, called your inner fish that we've talked about on the, on the podcast. Oh, excellent. Before. Excellent. And uh, it's, it's 
really just a fantastic book. I, I have a copy of it in my office, actually, uh, that I told all of our students that if they wanted to read, you know, they could come borrow my copy because it really is just a, a fantastic book. It's a fantastic book. And the hook kind of that starts the book is really about those discussions that Neil and I had and then putting together those expeditions to go up north um, uh, because it really was, interestingly, it was sort of you know, the way science works. It was like, okay, we have a hypothesis that if we look in non-marine beds of, you know, material about 370, 375 million years old, we might find something interesting related to the origin of limbs. And so we found through, you know, previous scientific work, we, we found, okay, here's rocks that meet all those criteria. They're not down the street. They're way up in the Canadian Arctic, but that's right. good. Uh, we, Neil and I often have a... Uh, we have a, a, a sort of a, a phrase we use a lot, which is if, if it were easy, somebody else would have done it already. <laughs> so anyway, we, um, yeah, we, we really um, used the scientific method. It's a great example of how paleontology really is almost predictable. Now that we have a, 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 a framework for the history of life, we can pretty much you know, predict times and to some degrees ecosystems. Uh, which are represented in the sedimentary rocks, um, uh, we can almost predict that we might find fossils of the right kind in those sorts of rocks. Yeah, and I think that's really uh, important that you mentioned, you know, the hypothesis testing bit of it, because geology, especially historically, has been one of the more just descriptive mm -hmm. of sciences. Uh, but especially lately, just as, you know, the, the you know, world has been, you know, better mapped and we have better understanding of the course of earth history, we can do a lot more of these sort of larger scale hypothesis testing, going out, looking for things in places where we think they should be and then finding it. Exactly. Yep. I agree. And it does, it does take paleontology along. I remember people kind of saying, ah, oh, paleontology, it's, it's stamp collecting. You know, you find it, you yeah. put it in a drawer. <laughs> And that's that. Well, well, no, because evolution is this incredibly dynamic process, and and we're we, and and creative process, and uh, somewhat pre not predictable in the sense of what will something become, but really predictable when you look back and you can start to draw connections between things, shared designs, uh, and 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 begin to, as we said, hypo make I build hypotheses about what we may be missing and where we might find it. Absolutely. Um, so I know that you have to get going relatively soon, but uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us here and, and telling us a bit about yourself and uh, about the museum. Oh, gosh. About the Academy. Gosh, it, it's really my pleasure to be part of the podcast. I'm, I'm glad you're interested in the Academy of Natural Sciences. I hope, uh, I hope you and others will, will visit it, use those resources. That's what they're there for. The, the collections, or even just the public displays and things. But uh, particularly for academic purposes, you know, museums are absolutely resources that, that are there to be used. And um, uh, we're, we're excited that the Academy has so much to offer. And, and thank you for, for help letting me you know, talk about what I do. I, I, I enjoy doing it, so I, I enjoy talking about it. <laughs> awesome. Um, so with that, we'll cut back to uh myself and the other hosts in the past all right so that was our interview with uh dr ted dashler thank you again so much dr dashler for uh a the tour of the museum and then also you know agreeing to be on our little rinky dink podcast here um again i, I don't know love. what he said but i know what i asked him uh so we'll <laughs> see <laughs> how that works with uh with the whole presentation but hopefully you folks enjoyed hearing about the museum I always love that we can have some guests uh, on the show just to bring in that kind of uh, that new perspective um, and to you just learn about something in a different way than uh, we normally would. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Deschler, for, you know, for being on the show. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing the uh, the podcast in whole uh, once we are once we're done here. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Plus, he just seemed like just a genuinely nice guy, uh, you know. That's one of the perks of being like staff now is that I got to hang out with like the teacher that uh, was teaching the paleontology cat course uh, at our university here. 
so I got to sit with him and uh, Dr. Dashley during lunch. And we just, you know, got to chat about, you know, stuff and talk about cool paleontology things, which is which is always fun for me. But he just seems like a, a genuinely nice guy. And a genuinely nice guy. We are not. However, you will have to deal with us in two <laughs> weeks. But until then, this has been episode 108 of I Wish You Were Dead, the podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Fia. And Gavin was here, too. Thank you to Dr. Deschler for being on this episode, and we will see you all in two weeks. Take care, everybody. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Fenella Campanino. It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you.